thanks for showing up. Uh, we've been working really, really hard <laughs> to get uh, to this demo. Uh, haven't even had time to shave, so. <laughs> uh, but um, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to go through things smoothly today and show you XP7, what it is and sort of where we're going and what you can expect from now on. So, number one, uh, so the, our main target with XP is to enable people to build better customer journeys, customized digital solutions, and uh, basically simplify the work that's involved in this. Being the top layer for any systems running around and being able to be fast and smooth and all of that, and have people run it anywhere where they like and spend less time fiddling around with technology, basically. And um, that's our main driver. This is our focus. And uh, our vision is that XP not only will be software, but a complete platform as a service. And so you can see here some of the bullets I have here. Most of these are now in place with XP7. But the actual cloud, the Nonic cloud, the self-service part, is our next big thing. So, um, but, the, but the nice thing when you use XP is that you can actually bring this anywhere. And then you have sort of a, a platform that you can, it's a portable platform, portable platform as a service, which is pretty unique. And obviously the CMS part is also unique in such a stack. So. Um, XP7, release candidate one is live, release candidate two coming today. Uh, we're in the final stages now of verifying that everything works, including putting it live on our own systems. So it's kind of a, a massive uh, sort of circle here of dependencies. For instance, uh, Inonic XP uses Market. Market is an app built on XP. Market uses Guillotine, which is a library. Guillotine uses another library, which is <laughs> also XP. And you can see how all of these things have to be upgraded and are ready before we actually launch XP. So we have this sort of uh, eat our own dog food before we give it to anyone else strategy. And uh, it's, it's quite a lot bigger when you have to upgrade everything that's around the, the, the platform. But the nice thing is you can, you can take this today and try it out. Uh, it will be, I guess, 99.9% .9 the same as the final release. We've been testing things for a month or so, but we're just missing the, the last pieces. So uh, we would really, really like to see your sort of input uh, on, uh, on how you feel this work. And if you find any bugs, of course, that would be awesome if you spend some time on testing it. So XP7. The biggest thing isn't the XP itself, it's, it's literally everything around it. And uh, one of the biggest, uh, biggest things is this, the developer portal. So I'll go to it live instead. Developerinonic.com. So this is where you'll find all resources, everything you need as a developer from now. And um, it's divided into some various sections. It's uh, the reference documentation. So for instance, here you can see the uh, new CLI documentation, Inonic XP, some other things we feel are important. And here you'll see all our other pieces of software, like our uh, HTTP client library, um, Timeleaf, which is now separated from XP core Content Studio, which I'll get back to later, etc., etc. This is not 100% finished, so you will find to-dos and stuff like that in the docs now. But we are working to complete that within the next few weeks. So um, the other section is guides. So guides is where you're gonna find hands-on examples on how to do stuff. 
This is all also where you'll find uh, things like the starters. So uh, we'll focus a lot on the starters uh, in, the, in the upcoming months. So for instance, the headless CMS starter docs here takes you through sort of how do I use this starter kit. And if you have sort of, sort of interesting ideas on what should be here, please let us know and we will try to produce that documentation. So common, let's say, common questions and requirements are, are more easily uh, accessible for everyone. Then we have the getting started section, which with XP7 is literally brand new. And um, I guess this is a nice segue to uh, actually installing XP, but I'll I'll hold on for a few seconds. So um, we can see uh, now you have Mac OS and Windows. Linux will ap be appearing here shortly. You can also run the CLI on Windows. But this is what you need to do. You run a few commands, three commands, and then you have everything running. We'll, we'll, we'll do it uh, pretty soon. So this is um, basically how to get going with XP. So this is where you should point anyone that Oh, I want to try XP, you just point them there and they should be able to, to do everything they need. So what's interesting about the developer portal is of course it's also built with XP. So if I log in here now, <coughs> still running on um, XP6. So we go to Content Studio here. We can see the developer portal here. And um, I mean, basically, on the, it looks like a site here, right? That's all, all fine. And uh, if I have a look at the getting started piece, we can see that it has been built. with the various layouts and text components. Here's like a, a smart box with the steps to install. So all of this is just another layout. There's a box to choose guides and documentation. Basically just plain website. But the interesting part comes when we go to the, the docs or the guides actually. Um, so if you look at the uh, Inonic CLI here, for instance, we can see that it has some interesting structure here with some master. If I go to XP7, it's a 7.0. You can see this weird icon. So all the documentations are prepared to be, let's say, versioned. So when we release uh, 7.1.0, you'll have a new branch here in the docs, as you can see. If I browse into it, we can see, uh, if I click this one, here you can see the documentation, right? We can go into storage, NoSQL syntax. Okay, so you, you think, Thomas, are you really editing all this stuff in XP? <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm not. This is, the, this is the cool part, because everything that comes in here comes from Git. So if I have a look at this, um, oh sorry, GitHub, Nonic, Doc, XP. So we made that a separate project, but essentially for most of our apps, the doc is inside together with the code. So that's a part of our idea here, is to simplify for us and hopefully in the future others, uh, the way you document uh, projects. And here we can see we have a docs folder. And here we can see a lot of files. So what, what did I click? The uh, storage, no SQL. So here you can see it's all ASCII doc files. So it means that as a developer, I can keep on working here with my code and my text uh, editor and produce huge documentation. And whenever I commit, it's a message goes to XP or to the developer portal, which then goes back, checks out the repository, 
compiles the ASCII doctor files locally to HTML, then imports them into XP. So we can do search, uh, for instance, and we can get the nice navigation and URLs. So if you have a look at uh, the entry point, is of course then a content. So let's see the, this one. You can see docs, XP, and then the seven zero here. So the entry point for this is actually this, this content here. If I edit it, I'll show you how we made it. So here you can see as an, as an editor, I've said, oh, we want this documentation into the portal. So I create a new, a new content, content type is doc, uh, fill in some uh, title, uh, URL, some tags, teaser image, and then I simply just specify where, where's the repository of the documentation. That's all I need to do as an editor. And then I can, of course, use this content and link it into the front page and stuff like that. But then the other part is basically just making sure the, of course, the, the structure in the repo is, makes sense. And, uh, and you set up a webhook that talks back to uh, this site. So that's it. Uh, then you see how we're producing the documentation. And I know there are some things that need to be fixed. Uh, well, we'll get that done soon. But for instance, the search should include some more titles. So if I search for no SQL, oh, sorry. No SQL data store, you can see something here, but it's sort of not entirely obvious that this is inside the uh, Inonic XP. So it just says seven zero, but it doesn't say the name. So it's more tuning we're doing. But again, eating our own dog food. Uh, and this is really useful because we can see the various ways of using the platform. All right, questions to that? Cool. Of course, we will work to release this uh, sort of documentation portal stuff uh, as both libraries and starter kits in the future. So anyone can build similar, let's say, aggregated documentation portals. Because the problem is it's not just one small documentation piece <laughs> or one big for that sake. It's dozens of and hundreds, I guess, of, of documentation pieces going together. All right, so uh, let's go to the getting started section now. So to, um, to use XP7, the entry point is in Onyx CLI. Okay, you can do it differently. You can sort of do it the old, old fashioned way <laughs> as well. Uh, but uh, the CLI helps you with the, all the common tasks that you need to do. So as a Mac user, I will use something called Brew. Anyway, I mean, who are using Mac here? Oh. <laughs> and how many of you already have Brew? Okay, so most of you, that's good. So the other one there, Windows, we use something else called Scoop. Who are using Windows? Who have heard of Scoop? Not too many. Okay, so Scoop is a, is a package installer for Windows, similar to how Brew works for the Mac, and it installs in a few a minute or so. And the nice thing is with, with that installed, you can do things like Scoop, Add, v, VGET, all these command line tools. So it's actually a very nice feature to have uh, if you're running on Windows. We are, have also built, uh, let's say, a normal installer. But it's not as nice because upgrades and all that stuff will be more messy for you. So we, we try to have people install using Scoop. So uh, let's try to install on my machine then. So Inonic, I don't have that. So brew tap Inonic. Slash CLI or two seconds. Yes, that should be it. So with brew, there's also, it, oh, that was fast. Brew install in Onyx. We'll see now. Yes, okay. So typing in Onyx, I can see I now have version 104 of the CLI. There's been some interesting days with uh, fiddling with the native uh, <laughs> stuff with the different platforms again. But uh, 
it uh, seems to be pretty mature now, the, the CLI. So, perfect, we now have the, the CLI, the first step. Step number two, let's, let's build an app. So, Inonic project create. And this is where things start to get interesting. Now goes on market and finds starters. And remember, a starter now can be anything. Um, and if you happen to make a really good starter, we'd love to put it on the market. So think, uh, think out of the box. It doesn't just have to be this sort of semi-technical things. It could be like a, a documentation portal starter, right? It could be an e-commerce site. Anything you imagine. Because now you have access to both the app engine part and storage of data. Everything you need in a practical application. So I'll, I'll choose something here. Uh, we can choose the headless CMS starter. And it will ask you, what's the name? What do you want to call it? I'll go for the default here. What do you call it? Uh, the folder, headless demo application version. So yeah, we'll start with the snapshot. That's always fine. And you can always go in to the project files and override these sort of default values later. So now it's going out to whatever Git repo. I could also specify, if you noticed, I can also specify manually a Git repo. So um, now it goes out, fetches, um, uh, clones the, the sort of the um, repo, uh, sets up the local project, and next is a new thing that you've never heard about before. It says, do you want to uh, create a new sandbox? And uh, obviously I forgot to do one thing here because I didn't delete. You can see I already have a sandbox here. Um, so what I'll do, I'll use that opportunity to show you something. I'll cancel it and then I'll remove my project. Uh, headless demo. So when you use Inonix CLI, it will create a folder in your local uh, users directory. It's called .inonic. Sorry, .inonic ls. And uh, here you'll find two new folders called, is it very low, I guess? Uh, distributions and sandboxes. So going into uh, sandboxes, I see that there's this corporate sandbox that I already had, right? Okay, let's go into that one. I now get uh, another dot in only folder and I get the home. So all of you that have been developing with XP6, you know that you can have XP home. So basically a sandbox is an XP home. It means that you can have uh, you can download XP 7.0 release candidate one and you can use it on many sandboxes without duplicating anything or many homes. So what I'll do now, I'll just I'll remove the dot in on folder. Some bad preparation there. I'll go through the steps again. In on project create. Headless starter. Demo application version initializing project. So this is uh, just waiting for Git, I guess. There we are. So sandbox is required. Do you want to create one? Yes. What do you want to call it? Oh, my demo. And which version of XP do you want to use? And it now detects that I'm on the Mac. And there's also a new small other thing here called the SDK, which you're not used to. Uh, essentially now there's two versions of XP. It's, it's the SDK and it's the server version. And the SDK contains everything you need to compile and build and all that stuff. Essentially the JDK, the full JDK, 
where the server version only contains what you need to run it in production. So the, the server files are like 100 megs smaller or something. And uh, our plan is to optimize that further so we can just cherry pick whatever we need for the server version and we can maybe tune that more specifically than what you need on a local development environment. Anyway, that's what we're downloading. And if you want to, you can use the SDK for production as well. So I'll now choose the release candidate one. And it goes out and fetches it. Whoa. Oh, of course. I forgot. I'm using my mobile phone for everything now. Yes. Well, seems to be working. We'll have to just wait for it to download on rather than to stop it. So as you can see so far, it's literally just a few command lines to get the CLI, to set up a project, and now it's also downloading XP for me. And um, when that's completed, we actually have a complete development environment with the exception of sort of the editing tools where you can use whatever you like anyway. And we'll also see how the actual sort of building and deployment works soon. Ah. So this uh, new distro, it's about, I think it's 250 megs or something, because it now contains Java, right? So you don't have to deal with, uh, okay, I'll install that Java, I'll make sure that version is right with this version of XP and that home, etc. You don't have to deal with all this stuff. Java is completely embedded, so you, you only have basically the XP runtime. The distro here is, is everything you need to um, both be working as a developer and for production. We've also been uh, working on uh, new Docker images. So um, the Docker images, the first we release will be for this server edition. And um, we managed to reduce, I think, the size from 1.4 gigs to 400 or something. So that's good. XP is getting bigger and the Docker image gets smaller. So now. We'll see here. Unzipping. And as you can see, it now says Sandbox is created and the project is now linked to the Sandbox. Nice. So going into the um, CD headless demo, I'll also disconnect, so I'll use the local network instead, if that's better. So, so far, installed CLI, created project, and now I want to deploy it. So next command, anonic project deploy. What it does is that this is a sort of a wrapper for calling Gradle. So all starters need to have the Gradle wrapper <laughs> uh, added. So it basically, go, if you don't have Gradle, it will fix everything, goes out, fetches everything, and uh, compiles the app. And when it's compiled, it will say, hey, do you want to start the sandbox as well? Sure. Launches the sandbox, which is basically the same thing that you've been doing previously. And XP itself is so, sort of, in many ways, the same. Yeah. And uh, we see a lot of Uma Thurman and stuff here is because of the, the headless starter has some data. So let's have a look at it. Localhost 8080. Okay, it's familiar. Logging in. And there's one interesting thing now, right? Can you see what's different here? Anyone? Huh? Developer? Content studio. Yeah, yeah, that's true. This is true. And there's no content studio. Ah, <laughs> that's cool. Uh, so the first time you'll do this, you'll get the tour. Go through the steps. And uh, it will recommend you to install these three apps. 
So Live Trace, Data Toolbox, and Content Studio. I'm going to install the apps. And now you get them. So short version is Content Studio is now an app. It's taken out of XP Core and put on market instead. Why? Well, because XP is an application platform. It means you can, you can do anything. You don't, you don't have to do CMS, right? But the CMS core and everything sort of that you know is still, still in there. So the APIs, so you don't need to, let's say, install Content Studio to deploy a, a CMS application, actually. <coughs> the Content Studio is just the editing interface for, for that kind of data. And let's open it. So now this is the one most exciting uh, data set, uh, Brad Pitt. And you can see there's no preview here. We're going to do that. We're going to make this headless starter much cooler. So we'll have more, as I, more exciting stuff around it. Um, but it's, it's the same thing. Also a small improvement to the um, Contest Studio is that if you click a file or something like that, you'll get pre preview for that as, as well. So like um, audio, video, things you might have uploaded, PDFs, you also now get preview for those in, uh, in Content Studio. And uh, editing content is pretty much, pretty much the same as you know it. There's some improvements to, uh, to the authoring interface. But I'm not going to focus on that very much today. I can share a few things with you from my slides, I think. Yeah, I'll get back to that. So image styles is a new thing. When uh, in XP6, when you use the editor, you insert an image and then you could choose uh, between sort of predefined cropping effects or something, what you call it, like uh, cinema. With XP7, we're doing done a pretty big uh, refactoring ourselves, but it's, it's not that big for you. But the short version is you can now determine these, as we call them, styles yourself now. So if you want to have the highlighter style, <laughs> whatever that might be, right? It might be uh, a round cropped image on the server, and when you get it to the client, it's going to be drop shadowed or something. I don't know, <laughs> whatever you like. So the short version is you can now combine the server side effects resizing, cropping, whatever you like, with client-side styling. And we're tagging that in the, yeah. Can we also control everything on the back side with the image? So say, uh, generating fixed versions, uh, different resolutions for different APIs? Uh, yeah, you could do that. Uh, but that's a too big discussion for now. Uh, so short version is what we're doing, is that we're tagging in the data. We're tagging. Um, the image, the figure element, and the image element with the style you select. So you can do client side things. And it also contains a file on the server that's associated with the same style. So you can then basically get that effect. So when, when, you, when you create URLs, you can get, let's, oh, it will crop it and scale it like this. Yes? Is that in the, in the rich text? So yeah, that's only for rich text. Basically, basically. Mm. And you can study this, uh, of course, try it out and have a look at it. Uh, so, but it pretty much works the same way you, uh, you're used to, but you can now specify your own styles, basically. And I'll, I'll show you more of this later. Also, we've improved the, um, this, um, this panel on the right. This panel. As you can see, you now have details inside when you're editing. So you can now have every custom widget that you have, like Google Analytics or some other tool. You can have that when you're editing as well, because it used to be limited to be only in the grid. Well, that's pretty useful. And uh, when I'm editing a page, you'll have also the insert and drag and drop stuff here. So uh, yeah, for instance, the emulator, yeah, of course hidden when I don't have a page. All right. I'm going to skip out of that now. Could you, could you pick up the uh, image so that we can see the image in the editor? Uh, we haven't changed that, I think. Oh, you mean uh, the, in the editor, inside the editor? Yeah, it's here. Uh, so 
you have some limiting uh, on this side? Mm, no. Okay. That's pretty much the same. So it's only about the editor. When you're working with the rich text editor and placing image inside that, that's where the styles come in. Yeah. So the image, there's no changes to that itself. There have been some requests on having us, let's say, reduce the size when people upload and stuff. So I we have that. Have, uh, reducing size? Yeah, we've heard that from many. So <laughs> that's in the backlog. Yep. Yeah. All right. So, so far, I built an app, installed the CLI, deployed the app, started XP. It's just a few command lines. If I want to build another app now, Canonic project, let's do the uh, PWA starter. Oh, maybe not a good idea to have the same name, sorry. My PWA test. Uh, And then I can choose the same sandbox or create a new one. So I'll choose the same one. And then we'll do uh, Inonic, oh sorry, CD, PWA test, Inonic project deploy. Oh, this one takes a bit more time to build because obviously, uh, even if we're using Gradle to kick off the build process, you can include anything you like as sub uh, subsidiaries like here now it's doing a lot of npm in installs and all that so you can do any kind of let's say javascript wizardry uh, on top of the build scripts and we see that this is getting more and more sort of common now and uh, i have something for you later on that as well okay so now inonic project deploy Ah, I did deploy, sorry. Maybe I did it already. No, closing down a few windows. Oh, it doesn't import stuff now, and it does. Uh, where does that go then, Alan? Web, Web app. PWA. Oh, what did I call it? my PWA test. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Okay, there. So that's also uh, a change from uh, from earlier. You had the main JS file. If you wanted to build a web app, you did the main JS file. The main JS file is you now exclusively reserved for lifecycle events. So it will basically uh, be triggered when you start an app on the server. So you could do smart things like uh, load stuff, cache stuff. Um, and to build a, a web app, you now create a web app JS file. So it's in the documentation. Also, there's a change that you should know about for the site. So the URL used to be like portal draft, right, portal draft HMDB or whatever the whatever the URL to the site was. So here you can see I actually have the API now. Again. No, no. Okay, that would be the six version with uh, seven you will do site default draft. Okay, so that's uh, the guillotine API. So I can just show you that as well. GraphQL Playground. URL open. So it's suiting to just show you also the, um, the docs now, developer. See if we can find uh, headless starter. And these docs have some examples of queries I can run. Yeah, do something very simple then. Uh, 
Okay, so there I'm accessing the headless data uh, and using that um, URL. But where I was going was um, this. So site and default. So why why is that? So the call projects, and it's essentially multi-repo sites. So when I go back to data toolbox here, we can see the data tree. We can see that there is no CMS repo anymore. It's been renamed to com in on CMS default. So the default name is actually this last piece here. So in the future, you'll be able to create multiple repos for isolated sites. So you can have different people working on different sites and data and uh, basically isolating them. And Content Studio will follow up, up on that. So you can say, oh, create a new project. It will set up all, all this for you. So this is the short version why you now have site slash default. And we also figured out that site was more specific uh, name than portal, basically. And here you can see that the PWA starter created its own repo, et cetera. So this is uh, fully implemented and ready to use? What you see now, yeah? Yeah, but it's not production ready because we haven't released 7.0 yet. Uh, so, but definitely, yeah, everything I'm showing you now is, is live. I haven't cheated with anything, I've not installed anything up front. I actually had to delete something. <laughs> so, uh, so yes, uh, and it would be really cool if you, you spend some time and try it out and see if, I mean, maybe something fails with you. Uh, let us know if you find bugs. Please let us know. So um, this is definitely ready to, to start uh, working on. And the, the thing that's least ready is the documentation. Yeah. This is truly multi-tenant? Multi-tenant? Uh, no, XP is not multi-tenant itself. You have to start multiple instances of XP because all the apps essentially share the same access and stuff, so you cannot have multiple yeah, apps. No, in not, not in terms of apps. Of course, on top of XP, you could have as many customers as you like. So it's, it's what do you mean by multi-tenant, right? Uh, it's, uh, I could easily build something here that can allow different tenants on top, but it's not multi-tenant in, in the way that you can access, uh, install different apps from different customers. So that's a decision we made because uh, we think it's better than just to start a new, a new instance over here and then you're guaranteed that it's isolated and there's no one stepping on each other's toes or security issues or things that you might get out, out of that. Other questions so far? No? Because I'm we can take a break. Okay. All right. So we'll just start this uh, session number two by mentioning a few things that people have asked me about. So the embedded version of Java is 11.1, .1 and the uh, XP6 used one, yeah, eight. So uh, that also means that you get some new features from the Nasorn engine for ECMAScript 6. It's not complete, but it's more than you used to have. So you get keyword symbols, iterators, collections, and literals. And um, that's nice if you use it. I guess you can use the transpilers anyway. Um, but the other thing to mention is that we also upgraded Elasticsearch inside XP to a newer version. Uh, so those are, the, let's say, the big, the big components that have been changed in XP. Uh, but you'll mostly be transparent for you, I hope. So obviously with, uh, with Java 11, there's compiling and stuff that goes on. But unless you have Java in your project, you won't notice at all. Also, there's a few small features <laughs> to mention. Uh, uh, if you have built web apps with XP, you will probably have used uh, the router library. The router library didn't used to work on sites. Now it does. So it's essentially working the same way. If you want to have a, the router library running on your site, you can create a mapping. And then you can say, oh, here, 
on slash my my code and then you can trigger the router and handle all the all the typical use cases and then there's another uh, new feature for sites which is I will say it's sort of a beta right now because it's a new feature but you can try it out and it's called uh, site filters so the short version is is you can then have a JavaScript controller that will act as a filter in front of uh, whatever paths on your site you decide so it means that you can for instance be in front of any request going to the site and back with JavaScript you have been able to do this and much more with Java since the beginning but now you can do it with JavaScript so but it's a it's an early version and I know the docs are not actually there for the filter yet but it's coming with the release so have a look at filters I think that's gonna be used for cool things right anything else I've forgotten that I should mention before we look at the upgrade guys nothing okay so next we will uh, go through an upgrade process uh, so um, short version is to upgrade from XP 6 to 7 you need to upgrade all your apps and make sure also the uh, third-party apps you're using are upgraded then you if you want to do this without any downtime you have to set up a new environment you then dump the data from the production environment you turn on the read only switch so no new data is coming in that's at least recommended then you you dump the data you take them over to your new instance you update the dump upgrade it and then you load it then you install all the apps and then you go live that's the short version so in this process the the big the big thing is upgrading the apps so I'll, I'll try to take you through that now so first thing to do I have uh, I haven't had too much time to prepare everything but uh, I have set up took one of our sample apps and started 615 here let's see content studio yeah so it's this uh, corporate app we can see it here and we can see it here so you can uh, with 615 you have the toolbox shell script you can use that to dump or you can use data toolbox which is here so you can then click um, system dumps create a dump you can call it something corporate dump that's what sounds nice <laughs> and then you can tick to include version history or not we actually recommend to if you don't absolutely have to we recommend don't include the versions when you migrate to xp7 there's several reasons for that one of them is that most versions will be removed anyway by xp7 later um, this is related to a new feature in the storage because the storage in xp6 it literally just whenever you change something it will create a new version new version behind the scenes and it, it will uh, just keep keep on going <laughs> uh, even uh, if those versions are needed or not you didn't have an option to choose i don't want versions with the question yeah uh, can, can you have this particular in uh, xp7 yes so so what happens in xp7 is that it still creates new versions but you can con consider them like objects in uh, in uh, in java for instance where you have the garbage collector that will come later and pick up the stuff that you didn't use so uh, technically it works the same way it just keeps on creating versions but uh, now most versions will be garbage collected now number one the garbage collector isn't part of 7.0 it will be part but in 7.1 the garbage collector will be added and you will be able to do some tuning how frequent how frequent how old should, should stuff be before it sort of gets vacuumed so um, also talking about vacuum that was a feature that literally did this in 6 version 6 
try to remove stuff that could be deleted. Uh, and uh, so this new garbage collector is basically a, a rewrite of that, and it's going to be much faster and more efficient. It's just going to do things really, really quickly. So um, we'll still make versions, but the ones that aren't in a branch or aren't committed will be deleted eventually. So that's the new feature. So basically, when you're using Content Studio, when you click Publish, we also do a commit. It basically means that we are okay. We're adding an entry in something we call a commit uh, in the system that says, okay, these uh, nodes with these versions must be kept. And then you can go back. You can see the commits. You can see what was made. So programmatically, if you want to control it, then you you will say, oh, okay, commit this stuff. Okay, that's clear. So don't include version history when you migrate. You don't need it, you get the faster upgrade and yeah, life is better. So create the dump, close, and uh, now I can select it and I can, it's on my computer, but I can still, I can download the dump. So there, I have the corporate dump. Fantastic. So now I don't need XP6 anymore. <coughs> I'll get rid of that. And the next step is setting up a sandbox. So Inonic Sandbox Create. The name Corp Corporate. Which version of XP? I'll go for the latest. Ta-da! Sandbox running with the RC1. So next then, start the sandbox. So in Onyx, sand, sandbox start. So if I happen to have another sandbox running, the CLI will detect it and will ask, do you want to stop it, etc. Help you out with that. So you can't run two instances, two sandboxes at once. So now it will ask me which sandbox do you want to start? Corporate. All right, starting. So now that's a fresh instance, right? So I'll go to it, log in, and I'll just go through the install the sample apps because I need uh, I need the data toolbox. It's the fastest way. <laughs> So I'll use data toolbox and go to system dumps again. You can see no dumps here. Uh, load. And then we go to downloads. Corporate dump. And now I have it in the system. I can then click here. And then you see there's a new button enabled. It says upgrade the selected system dump. And then it says upgrading the dump will modify existing dump cannot be reverted. The reason for this is to avoid, let's say, creating another data set. If you have, the, I mean, 30 gigs or something of an upgrade file, we don't want to create 30 more gigs. People get problems with disk size, etc. So it's just going into that dump file and it's manipulating it to be compatible with XP7. So I'm going to run upgrade now. Upgrading, bam, finished. And the upgrade is actually really, really fast. We're actually surprised ourselves. <laughs> Glenn, <laughs> you didn't think it was going to be that fast, did you? But you, you'll have literally big data sets. It's, it's surprisingly fast. So uh, that's a good, good thing. We, we were actually not sure. Is it upgraded? <laughs> well, it is. So now, when it's upgraded, you can load the selected dump. Load. And uh, here's the only glitch we've found so far with um, RC1, which is going to be fixed in RC2. And it's that some of the apps don't get uninstalled. So if I refresh here, we can see I still have Content Studio and some other stuff running, but I actually erased it all in the data set. So that's, that's a glitch that's going to be fixed in RC2. So now it would actually have nuked everything I had there. 
So uh, to get that, I just have to quickly just stop it and start the sandbox again. So then it should be OK. Because remember, when you dump, you actually erase everything. So there we are. And as you can see, no apps installed. Uh, going into applications, I can see that I have my old apps because they were in the dump. But they are stopped because they are not compatible with XP7. So what I can do then is uh, I can, for instance, click Data Toolbox. Uh, sorry, I can click here. It's a bit peculiar, but this is the way it works. So I updated Data Toolbox, and now I can install Content Studio as well, right? So there we are. But the corporate theme is still stopped, right? Because it's it's an old app. So the next step is now to upgrade this app. And uh, to get that done, oh. I'll go to GitHub. No, like. And I can see that, OK, this is the project. You obviously have to have the code to upgrade it. So I'll clone that one down. Git clone. So cloning the app. Okay. See the app. Corporate. So there we have the code. And uh, to go through the steps of upgrading, there's going to be a bit cheating here because we don't have time to do everything manually. You will go to developer portal. Go to Inonic XP documentation. You go down to the release notes, and then you have upgrade notes, which talk about the how to let, let's say do the steps. And then we have a special one for upgrading apps, which talks about all the small potential things you have to do. So most of you, only a few of the steps will apply, uh, but this sort of tries to cover everything. So if you just go through it, it says things like this: create the sandbox. Yeah, we already did that, right? And then uh, it says upgrade the Gradle wrapper, change some uh, Gradle sample files, uh, update your dependencies. So if you were using Timely, if you have to update the dependencies in your file. And then it talks a bit about uh, XP Home and the changes. Also, that's a nice small trick. If you want to do, let's say, Gradle directly, if you're not happy with the Anonic project deploy, <coughs> you will need two system variables. You will need uh, XP Home, like always, but you will also need a Java Home. <coughs> so you then have to specify the Java Home that's inside the distros, inside the .anonic folder, etc. And the fastest way to do that is just to run Anonic project shell. I'm not, I'm not saying this is going to be perfect for everyone, but that will launch a new terminal for you, and it will, will set these variables. Uh, so you can then do directly do Gradle stuff if, if you like to do that. Um, yeah, and then there's lots of small things like the schema changes here. So to make the XML more consistent, we have changed. So things are not called config. It's now form everywhere where if you're using the schema system. Um, and you can see examples there. Field sets no longer requires name, which was never used for anything. Also, there's an important detail, uh, which is the scope. When editors go in and, let's say, uh, create a blog post, and then they come to uh, uh, select an author, in XP6, the default was that you could select anything from the, from the repo which did cause a lot of, let's say, confusion and bad linking outside of the site. Uh, with XP7, the default is within the site for content, for, for regular content. For media, anything can be selected. But you can change this if you specifically want to, let's say, oh, I want this selector to allow fetching from slash uh, people's archive or something. 
then you can specify that in your code uh, by, uh, by setting the allow paths. Also, there's changes to the stuff called mixins, which was confusing because you could use mixins to make X data, etc. Now the concept is cleaner. So mixins are literally just reusable templates of, of schemas. And X data is this, is this new thing, standalone thing, which if you have been reading the latest docs for XP6, is created the same way. So you, you create a new folder X data and then the name of the X data and then you put the XML in there. And then there's no, let's say, mixins involved in that step unless you <laughs> want to reuse something. So it's basically simplifying things. But then there's uh, an important, uh, I'm getting to mixins, no. yeah. Content selector update, a small thing. Yeah, here X data, X data. Here you can see the structure. So now you used to mix the X data and mixins. Good, <laughs> mix them. Uh, but now you, you basically separate them. So it's much, um, it's easier to understand. Also, there's some important changes to the format. You used to be allowed inside basically the, the mix in here, which content types does this mix in apply to, but we've cleared uh, does this X data apply to. But now you basically go to the site and you specify, okay, this site will have these extra data. If you don't put it here, it will work for everything. So this, you can here you can filter it down. Centrally, you have control over what's happening. Uh, you don't have to go into 15 different X data files to figure out what's going to happen. Yeah, here we go to the image style. So this is a new file. It's called site styles XML. So if you if you place this in your project, then you you get the new functionality. <coughs> and you can see here what the settings are. But this is a let's say. This is just to keep the old styles. So you can see now it has uh, widescreen, regular, etc. So in the docs for styles, you'll see some more. But the short version is that you specify an aspect ratio, which is the server-side cropping effect. You can also add server, server f uh, is it called filters? Yeah, and other things. And this is the style name, so you could change that to something else if you like. But then you can also have a CSS class that matches that style. It's going to be in your in your HTML. Yeah, also here's, uh, there's some interesting things about this, but uh, at least trying to put scripts into editor won't work in XP7. Uh, there has been some sort of back and forth on that, and I, I think it hasn't worked in XP6 for a while. Uh, since we changed the editor. But uh, some of you might have people who have done that, which is actually a big, uh, let's say, uh, attack surface because you can have an editor literally hack your, your stuff by pasting in a script. <coughs> uh, so you can't do that anymore. You can if you change the setting, if you want them to hack it. Uh, yes, and then there's, uh, yeah, this is the, this, uh, response filters was something we called um, you probably used it if you if you used google analytics or any of these uh, apps that add scripts to your existing markup we use something called response filters to avoid let's say confusion with the new filters that's been renamed to uh, response processors and it has this very let's say niche functionality to uh, so you just have to rename here basically some of your folders and files. Yeah. Yeah. Also, there's a new rendering mode. This is based on requests from from customers. When you uh, when you render content, this is uh, again the CMS part. If you do that in, let's say, the the production site, versus if you do it inside the uh, edit mode, you will have different different rendering modes. And that can be used for you uh, as a developer to say, okay, I'm in edit, disable the, uh, the, the jumping box so people can actually select the, <laughs> the done thing. Um, but you can uh, now also have a new mode, which is called inline, which is used when you're in the grid. So it means that when you're browsing in the tree structure and you get the preview there, 
that's called inline. So if you want to treat that spe specifically, then you can now go in and say, okay, I'll remove, I'll remove all these tags. I'll clean up stuff so it doesn't sort of do things you don't want it to do. So you now have these three modes beyond the uh, the rendering. It's preview, which is the pop-up, edit when you edit, and inline when you get it in the uh, grid. We also renamed again for more consistency and simplifying things. We renamed user stores, so it's now called ID providers all over the place. So you will now go in, create a new ID provider, choose the app that has the ID provider code. So user stores concept or the name is gone. It's now all ID providers. Uh, should be again a bit easier to understand. So you, you might have to search and replace something. So I did that yesterday with an app and uh, that was even some Java code. And then just search for user store in the code and actually, yeah, okay, I just changed to ID provider. And that did the trick. Also, we talked about the new repo. So it's been renamed. Main.js we talked about. There's also uh, an important change to the require resolving. When you create a JavaScript, you specify require some other some other library or file. Uh, the resolving in 6.x was like a really, yeah, we did, uh, we did some, some changes from 5.0, basically. And uh, we kept that. So we've had some backward compatibility things. But the short version is that it's very simplified because it used to look up in a folder called dot dot slash lib, uh, look around in many places to find uh, the script. Now that's simplified, so you just have to read how this works. It's essentially, is it in your local directory or is it, is it in this subdirectory? Assets and services, yes. Um, probably most of you are doing this already, but if you have a really old app, you might find assets and services inside sites. That's no longer supported. You have to have assets and services on the root of resources. Yeah, and here you can see there's some still some to-dos. So if you built like a widget, like the Google Analytics widget, things like that, it's going to come soon. And then obviously, if you did uh, Java, you have to consider that it's now Java 11, then you'll probably get the compile errors on it. So you can fix that. All right. So now we're going to do all that manually. No. <laughs> so I'll just git and check out. Uh, seven zero, and uh, then uh, eh. so now I remember now this is any kind of repo was out there compared to earlier where I, I built it from scratch, right? Now I just took a repo from GitHub, and now I want to actually connect it with my my sandbox. So what I'll do is I go into the folder and then in Onik project sandbox. And then it says, hey, what sandbox do you want to use? Corporate. Perfect. And then I can do inonic project de deploy. Because just before I do that, I'll check. So I loaded the data, right? Content Studio. Yeah, and you can see that uh, obviously the app not running because you're missing the icons and stuff. So inonic project deploy. Deploy into corporate sandbox. All right. Just. So there we are. Just quickly have a look. I know that this was sort of very slow, so it's probably something in the code that hasn't been 100% fixed. But we can still have a look at the editor. So here you see the. Um, the editor, and I can now insert an image, which we talked about. Okay, and uh, now you can see apply style. No style or original. So if I choose original, it will serve the raw original image that you uploaded. It will probably sort of look nice, stay inside the frames. 
And that's useful sometimes. If you have an icon, if you have a GIF animation, something like that, then you'll use the original style. However, uh, you might want to do something cooler. Another nice thing here called um, custom width. So if I choose left align, center, right align, these are styles in your site. So if you want to have right align be a bit bigger or something, you can, you can, you can control this. But um, let's say I want to have it centered. And I can also choose custom width. And now you can see it says, ah, it's 60%. Right. We actually want the 37%. So you can actually do this too now. And then insert. Or I'll just skip that. Because what if we want to add some styles to our app? I'll go to the docs again. Here. We'll just copy these styles. And then I'll open my editor. SRC main resources site. No, oh, yeah. New file. Style styles. Uh, excellent. Paste, save, deploy. Just reload it to get sure I get everything here. So we are add image there. And now you can see I get styles here, widescreen. Same behavior as people are used to. So it's now up to you if you want to change something, of course, or I don't want any styles, or I want exactly these three styles. Then you can at least control that. Insert. Yeah, okay. So the, even if the, this template isn't set up correctly. So. No. The rendering is normally working fine. It's just something with the with the app here. All right. So that was the upgrade. Uh, questions? Have you set styles in order to compose it too, like links or paragraphs? And no, not yet. Uh, but that's designed into the system. So if you look at the if you look at this, um, it says styles there, and then it says image. So there will be styles for all the things as well. But we haven't didn't have the time to to make that now. So yeah, it will come. We know. <laughs> we know about it. All right. Other questions? I need to ask something about the dump. So about the dump? The dump? Yeah. So whenever there are a lot of sites, what I have seen that dump process takes a lot of parts. So is there any improvement in there uh, while making a dump or uploading a dump? Um, no, not essentially. Not as I'm aware of. But uh, what is, if you, if you, if you ignore the versions, it's going to be a lot faster at least. So that's my, my tip. Don't bring the versions along. They will likely get deleted anyway uh, later. So, so, so all, the, all the data you're actually using should be there. And then you just have to accept that, OK, something went away. And if you need to have a copy of that for some reason, then you just keep the, the old dump or keep the old instance. Mm. Yeah. No, so uh, basically when uh, we release 7.0, we'll go out to anyone that built an app and ask them to upgrade their apps. So uh, we hope that uh, everyone will take their time to do that. And you can start that job already now. It's, it's actually perfectly possible to upgrade your app using the RC1 dependency and, and release it. That's, there's not going to be any changes uh, practically to that. So, uh, so you can start right now if you have apps. Just start now. and. and Make them work. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, you know? Upgrading uh, sites hosted on the, and on the cloud. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, uh, do that? 
Yeah, the process is essentially the same as I showed you, but uh, we'll have have a discussion about how you want to do that, right? So, yeah. either a new yeah. instance. Uh, hmm? Yeah, but that doesn't matter. So that would be just setting up a new instance, and um, likely we'll, we'll discuss how we do that. Okay. Yeah. More? No? People are probably eager to get home, or on work, or to work. So um, yeah, if you have another other questions, oh sorry. Just one small thing. One more thing. Ah, we've had this guy that's uh, been working really hard <laughs> over the last months uh, and done something we think is pretty, it's pretty cool. So we're launching a new library and starter kit that helps you do server-side React, nicely integrated with how XP works. Uh, so you can use XP components, you can use React at the same time, and it has all the stuff that's uh, about hydrating going from the server-side render delivered page to a React running client-side page. This is very beta, but it's going to be released soon, so you can try it out and have a look at it. It's going to come approximately at the same time as XP7 S Pen. Maybe uh, if people want to talk to you about it, yeah. you can. Rise, rise up so they see who you are, yeah. So yeah, I know uh, uh, React is hot these days, so I think uh, this will be something to look into. Because then you can get both the initial rendering, super fast delivery, reuse your te React templates, client side and server side. Yeah, we know. <laughs> so, but it's, it's, this is a beta, and, uh, but the best way to get this smooth and nice is if you try it out. And we will let you know when it's live. And uh, you'll get the starter and all the documentation that's required. So hope that's uh, good news for everyone. And uh, just grab a hold of anyone you want to talk to afterwards from Inonic. And grab your own shirts. So uh, thank you.